Hello and welcome to episode 2 of the Elizabethans Review and Recap series. In this episode we'll be looking at the issue of Catholicism and the measures Elizabeth took to avoid conflict which allowed her to secure her role as the rightful Queen of England. So let's start with the differences between Catholics and Protestants. Catholics would only recognise the authority of the Pope. They believe that he's not only head of the church but he's also God's representative on earth. They would want the Bible and the church services to be in Latin, and they believe in something called transubstantiation, which is the physical belief that the um, bread turns into the actual body of Christ and the wine turns into the actual blood of Christ, which is different to what Protestants believe. The priests cannot marry. They would have Catholic mass on a Sunday and the churches are going to be highly decorative. In contrast, then, Following the Act of Supremacy in 1534, the English churches became a lot simpler. The Act of Supremacy placed the monarch as the head of the church rather than the Pope. The Bible was to be in the vernacular, in this case English, and the churches were much simpler and symbolic because the focus needs to remain on God. So Elizabeth herself has a problem. When she becomes queen, she's just followed on from her sister Mary. So Catholicism was once again reinstated as the main religion as England. So what she decides to do is introduce something called the Religious Settlement in 1558. It's intended as a compromise, which means she's not going to be Catholic like her sister Mary's, but she's also not going to be as strict Protestant as her brother Edward. Elizabeth is a moderate Protestant, which means she rejects the idea of transubstantiation, but she's not a radical Puritan either. So what she does, the Religious Settlement is split into two. The first part of it is the act of supremacy. She's very careful in the wording here. She calls herself supreme governor of the church and not supreme head. This is because she would believe that the head of the church should be Christ. Governors tend to oversee, they're important, but they use the views of others to make decisions. So what she's doing here, she's reinforcing the fact that Protestantism is going to be the true and official state religion, but she's also trying to pacify Catholics by not rejecting the authority of Christ. However, what is really clear here is she's stating it's not going to be ruled by the Pope. That means to not recognise Elizabeth as the head of the church is going to be considered treason. Then we've got the Act of Uniformity. So this is where she expects all citizens of England to um, attend the Anglican, so Church of England services on a Sunday. If you don't, you're going to be fined. So Bible services are going to be in English. The clergy, which are members of the church, could marry. Some Catholic practices like um, pilgrimages are completely banned and prohibited. But the compromise here is that Catholics could worship privately and some vestments that priests would wear, so the robes, would be allowed. It's called the Act of Uniformity. Think of a school uniform here. You wear a school uniform to give the impression, the outward impression, that you're all the same. And the same principle can be applied to the Act of Uniformity. Everybody needs to give the outward appearance of being a good Church of England Protestant. But Elizabeth doesn't mind if people wish to privately worship at home. That doesn't mean you can outwardly be Catholic and um, try and convert others. That's prohibited. But at home, should you wish to privately practice, you could. Again, giving Catholics some freedom. Compare that to her brother Edward, where Catholics are persecuted, she's being a lot more lenient. The idea is here, Catholics for an easier life should accept this on a whole and therefore comply and accept Elizabeth as Queen. Let's look at the responses then. The majority of Catholics in England then, we can call them conformists. So this is where many of them would just become Protestants to avoid fines. So these conformists, um, pose no threat to Elizabeth. Then we've got church papists. So most Catholics in northwest England attend the Protestant church service but maintain Catholic beliefs so they will be the ones practicing at home. They want to avoid paying the fines and they don't want to challenge Elizabeth as queen but one day they probably will hope for a Catholic successor. But again they don't pose any threat to Elizabeth because they are conforming to the law. There are going to be plotters throughout Elizabeth's reign, but there's fewer than 200. So plotters want to actually physically remove Elizabeth from the throne and they are loyal to the Pope rather than Elizabeth. But the people who actually are the biggest threats 
are the recusants. So these are thousands of wealthy English Catholics, mainly located in the northwest of England. They refused Protestant church services and went to mass instead. They can afford to pay the fines because they belong to the gentry or nobility class, and they hope to replace Elizabeth with Mary, Queen of Scots, who we'll talk about in future slides. These are actually the biggest threats to Elizabeth, because although they don't necessarily want to um, remove her and see her dead, they are the ones that have the money, the influence, and they are by, by far the most numerous. So let's now talk about that growing Catholic threat. So at the start of her reign, Elizabeth is very moderate and lenient. However, with the growing Catholic threat, she begins to change her attitudes. But let's see what's going on in the country. So in 1570, it's a turning point. There is a papal bull issued by Pope Pius V. So the Pope issues a statement and it's published in England and across Europe where he claims that Elizabeth is an illegitimate monarch. Illegitimate is referring back to her parenthood. And if you can remember from the first video I did, we spoke about the fact that Henry VIII was married to Anne Boleyn. That's his second marriage. Catholics would never have accepted the force, uh, first separation and therefore could have argued that Elizabeth was never a legitimate child and therefore couldn't inherit the throne. He also called her pretended queen, so again reinforcing the fact that she should not be Queen of England. And at this time, Mary Queen of Scots is also building up support. We'll talk about Mary Queen of Scots later on, but it's really significant because there is somebody else who is suitable to take the throne from Elizabeth. He's hoping to inspire internal and external rebellion. So that's within England, but also within foreign countries. And what's significant here is the fact that he's saying the rebels will have the protection of the Pope, and this means that some attacks are now going to be considered justified. So let's see what happens then with the priests in the country. So, not surprisingly, based on the paper board of 1570, the seminary priests from Europe start to come to England to try and encourage Catholics to um, keep going to Mass. The purpose of this then is to keep the faith alive within the country. But we also have the emergence of something called Jesuit priests. They are priests who are trying to convert people to Catholicism. They're a much bigger threat than seminary priests because they actually want to turn people away from Protestantism back towards Catholicism. And we'll look at some examples in just a moment. Priests could hide then in something called priests hold, and these would generally be in the wealthy Catholics' homes. So this is where they physically, there might be trap doors or secret rooms built in, so they could actually harbour um, these Jesuit or seminary priests secretly. A man called Nicholas Owen designed some of these in the most popular houses in the country. As a result, then, priests are hunted by Walsingham and his spies, and if they're caught, they would be executed. This leads to something called the Bloody Question in 1585. Any priest who would be arrested would be asked this bloody question, which is basically asking them in the event of a foreign invasion, if an army was to invade and try to reinstate Catholicism, who would they be loyal to? If they say they'd be loyal to the papacy, so the Pope, they're going to be executed for treason. But if they say they're going to be loyal to Elizabeth, their life would be spared, but they've abandoned the Catholic faith. Edmund Campion then is an example that we're going to look at here. So he's probably the most infamous Jesuit priest. He arrives in 1580. He's captured in 1581. He made a pamphlet about Catholicism and he's trying to encourage people to turn away from their Protestant beliefs. He's actually um, tortured quite extremely, stretched on the rack for information. He ends up being dragged to his execution in Tyburn where he's hanged, drawn and quartered for treason. Let's look at some of the plots then that are links to this. So let's start by talking about Mary, Queen of Scots. So Mary, Queen of Scots is Elizabeth's cousin. She is also named successor because Elizabeth does not have any children of her own. The problem with Mary is that she is Catholic and she rightfully can claim the throne because she does have Tudor blood. When the Protestants remove uh, Mary from the Scottish throne on allegations of murdering her husband, she came to England in 1568 hoping for help. So she was Queen of Scotland. She formerly was married to the King of France before he died. But she's actually overturned from the throne. She comes to England, comes to Elizabeth for help. Elizabeth has a difficult decision to make. 
She could say to uh, Mary, you need to go into exile, um, so to a foreign country like France, for example. But the problem with that is she might be able to harbour support abroad. So Elizabeth chooses to keep her in England and chooses to keep her under house arrest, which means she can regularly um, watch her movement and be in control of who visits her. The problem is many Catholics want to actually see Mary Queen of Scots ex um, succeed Elizabeth to the throne and for some cases they actually want her to take the throne from Elizabeth. So Mary Queen of Scots is referred to as a figurehead for Catholics. That's a term you need to know. This is really problematic because there is somebody who legitimately can claim the English throne. So particularly we're going to look at the Throckmorton and the um, Babington plots and this is a threat to the national security. So let's start then with the Throckmorton plot in 1583. The aim then in short is for the French army to invade England and replace Elizabeth with Mary Queen of Scots. It's devised by a man called Francis Throckmorton who is working with the French Catholic, the Duke of Guise. What's really important is their support from not only the Pope but Philip II of Spain. Mary Queen of Scots continued to be held in isolation and could not receive any visitors following the upheaval um, of this plan. It is unsuccessful, it is found out by Walter Gummany spies, but it leads to something called the bond of association. So anyone going forward um, associated with a plot or a leader of the plot could be executed. This proves that Elizabeth feels intimidated. What's really significant about this is because Mary Queen of Scots was not actively involved in the Throckmorton plot, the bonds of association now means in future um, plots against her, Mary Queen of Scots, just by being named as a figurehead, could be um, responsible for treason. Which brings us to the Babington plot of 1586. This was comprised by Sir Anthony Babington, who planned to rescue Mary Queen of Scots from jail and murder Elizabeth. Secret letters then were exchanged between the plotters and Mary and they were discovered as evidence to prove Mary's guilt. You might remember this from lessons where we looked at the fact that Walsingham was actually very aware of the plot going on and there was actually encoded letters that were transported in um, beer barrels. The um, plotters then are tortured and they get these um, confessions from them which names Mary as leader of this plot along with Babington. So this is the excuse they finally need to put Mary Queen of Scots on trial. She's found guilty and she's executed of treason. So this is a massive, massive change for Elizabeth because she's now broken the divine right of kings because she's actually killed a former monarch and somebody who is rightfully going to be heir to the throne of England. Elizabeth doesn't do this lightly, but with pressure from her advisers, whilst Mary is alive, she is a threat to Elizabeth, especially because she has no um, heirs herself. So let's have a look at how Elizabeth responds to these threats in her legislation and how she tries to keep on top of the problems that she might be facing. So one of the things that she does in direct response to the papal bull is to introduce the recusant fines. So um, Catholics who don't attend Protestant church services have to pay a fine to Elizabeth because they are breaking the acts of uniformity. In 1581, though, these fines are increased and this is called the Act of Persuasions. So following Edmund Campion arriving in England in 1580, um, who is a Jesuit priest, they now have to pay a £20 fine for not attending Protestant church but £66 if they're found attending Catholic Mass instead, and that'll be per month. So the amount that's going to cost them is increasing. This is mainly going to affect the gentry and the middling sorts, because anybody below that wouldn't be able to physically afford it, which is why most Catholics from um, the lower classes generally converted or conformed early on. 1585 then, we see the Act Against Jesuits and Seminary Priests introduced. So this is now going to allow the death penalty for anybody who offered to shelter priests in their own homes. So these would be in the priest house, uh, which is underneath the floorboards or behind portraits and so on. Searches were carried out on a much larger scale in Gentry's homes. Even informants told Walsingham that a priest potentially is being held. Margaret Chilthrow then is an um, example here that we can use as a woman who is executed for this in 1586. 
However, this had a bit of a negative effect because this was published in the pamphlets and she was made into a Catholic martyr. So she was seen as somebody who died for her faith, particularly the fact that she's woman. It actually probably had an adverse effect because it made people sympathetic towards the cause. Then in 1587, we've got the Recusant Act again. Two thirds of the lands owned by the Recusants could be taken. Even the wealthiest Catholics, such as Thomas Tresham, can now be forced into debt. So now the money, the amount they're being fined, is actually going to have a significant impact even on the wealthiest in society. In 1593 then we've got the statue of um, confinement so this is keeping people within five miles of the home. The purpose of this then is to prevent possible rebellion and conversion so it's keeping track of known Catholics movements to try and stop them from spreading any more influence. So why did these Catholic threats all fail? So firstly, we must credit Elizabeth's responses because she moves away from being moderate and starts becoming much harsher in trying to clamp down on any threat in the country. That just play a big part. Second reason, then, is the fact that quite often these priests would target the wrong places. They would concentrate them on the southeast of the country, but actually there were more recusants um, were higher in the north and the west of the country. There's also the wrong people as well. They were focusing on the gentry, but the majority of people are actually in the lower orders of society. So they should have focused on the more numerous population. Um, two divided, seminary and Jesuit priests wanted different things and often argued. And then lastly, there's too few of them. There's more of Watergum spies and therefore they were able to successfully uncover most of the plots against Elizabeth. And finally, we're going to look at the conflict with Spain and in particular the Spanish Armada. This is an example then of an external threat, so a threat beyond England. There are many causes of the Armada dating back to 1559. So Philip II had proposed to Elizabeth and she had rejected his proposal. Philip wanted to restore Catholicism in England and he was also keen to regain his role as the King of England because he was married to Mary I, Elizabeth's sister. In 1570s, Francis Drake had been pillaging and raging um, Spanish ports and ships in the New World, so America, and this angers the Spanish because they're missing out on money. And Elizabeth as well hasn't actually spoken out against this and has accepted money from men like Francis Drake. In 1583, Philip supports the Throckmorton plot, which obviously wanted to remove Elizabeth as queen, which obviously sours relationships even more. And 1584 and 1585, Elizabeth sent um, English soldiers to the Netherlands to support Protestant rebels against Philip's rule. So the Netherlands is actually part of the Spanish Empire and she spent, sends 7,000 men to actually rebel against him and help a man called William of Orange. So William of Orange is a Protestant ruler and he's actually, ex not executed, sorry, he's assassinated. And this leaves Elizabeth as the only Protestant ruler left in Europe. There's also the issue that Spain is Catholic and, of course, England is moderate Protestant, so they differ greatly on the terms of religion. And Spain's got the support of the Pope. And we know in 1570 um, the Pope has spoken out against Elizabeth and will support any ruler who goes against her. So let's look at the main events of Yamada. So the Armada, which is a fleet of ships, starts to be built in 1587. You may notice that that's just a year after the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. Whilst the Mary, Queen of Scots execution doesn't actually trigger the Armada or the war, it obviously increases tensions because it shows that she's actually um, prepared to execute um, another Catholic ruler. It's, they're already at war at the time, so all it does is actually make the situation worse, but it doesn't actually spark the war because it's already happened. There's an army of 20,000 men then is going to be led by a man called Duke of Parma. And the plan is they're going to collect more men from the Netherlands on the way. However, there's a surprise attack on Cadiz by um, Francis Drake, which damaged lots of the Spanish ships. So before they've even set sail, they're at a disadvantage. There's also lots of English lookouts. They spot the arrival of the Armada before they get to the coast. You might have heard the story where lots of beacons were lit, so it actually signified that they had arrived and the word spread really quickly. So it gave the chance for the English to actually prepare. The ships end up off the coast of Scotland and some ships, um, because they've got no maps and because of the poor weather conditions, they don't actually end up on target. So their numbers are actually diminished by the time that they arrive. 
So reasons for the failure, because it doesn't work, it's a monumental fail for the Spanish. Um, it's partly due to the tactics of the English and good leadership, but there's also factors they couldn't control. So the English use fire ships. They use smaller ships to um, push them into the crescent formation that the Spanish ships were using. And this led to lots of panic and confusion and massively helped the English gain an advantage. The Duke of Medina Sidonia then had limited experience in battle. He's, it's an example of poor leadership. Whilst he was a great military leader, he had no naval experience. Unlike the English who were being led by Howard, Drake and um, Hawkins. So the comparison is they are much more experienced um, naval officers. Spanish boats ended up um, on the Scottish coast due to strong northern winds. Um, the storms wrecked Spanish ships onto the coast and later Elizabeth would say that God blew and they were scattered. So this is the actions of God. There is a delay in the Palmer's um, troops meant that Armada was delayed in itself. And lastly, the Armada never picked up the troops in the Netherlands as communication was impossible. So the defeat of the armour was a very powerful propaganda tool for Elizabeth. She said that God was on her side. And going forward from 1588 onwards, this really secures Elizabeth as one of the leading um, rulers in the whole of Europe. And England goes from strength to strength in terms of power. That led said, though, they really were the underdogs at the start of the Armada. They had less men, less money and despite the fact that Elizabeth was successful, it did cost her £4.5 million because the war with Spain does continue for a few more years. It puts a massive drain on the already limited finances and she couldn't actually pay many of the soldiers so she has to keep them on the ships and many die. So it's not completely a, a success for Elizabeth. There are some negativities that follow. But overall, following the victory of Spain, the Catholic threat did fade and the majority of Catholics in England start to attend Church of England services without complaint. So overall, we can see that by 1588, Elizabeth on a whole has very successfully managed to handle the issue of Catholicism within England. And she now has a much stronger rule in her country. <laughs>